In contrast with phosgene, MIC was stored in three vast tanks, originally buried in a concrete bunker near the edge of the plant. 40 feet long and 8 feet in diameter, each was capable of holding 42 tons of the potentially lethal chemical. Where phosgene was a famous killer kept in small quantities, MIC was stored on a scale that would kill thousands. Eight forty-five. The pipes that were being washed started to become choked with the dirt being carried by the water. The nozzles became blocked and water began to back up, flowing into one of the main pipe systems that ran throughout the plant. MIC is very handy stuff. It reacts to produce particular molecules that uh, we probably couldn't reach easily by other chemistry. So it's very useful to the chemist. He can build things in a way that he wouldn't otherwise be able to do. It's also reactive, which means that things that happen, happen fast. We, uh, we don't need very long reaction times, and we tend to get perhaps cleaner chemistry, fewer waste products. However, the reactivity is a problem. Uh, it means that it's going to react with a whole range of things it might come into contact with. Uh, water, for example, or worse still, people. Keeping MIC apart from water is vital, because if the two liquids mix, anybody nearby would be in serious danger. MIC is a highly irritant gas. It has two important physical properties that make it particularly unpleasant. The first is that it's very soluble in water. Uh, and the second is that it, it, it vaporizes or, or boils at a temperature almost exactly the same as, uh, as, as the body. This means that if you inhale MIC at low concentrations, it's going to affect in the first place those parts of your body that are wet, which will absorb the M MIC. That's your eyes, your mouth, your throat and your upper airways. At high enough concentrations, it'll get the whole way down to that part of your lung where oxygen is transferred into your bloodstream. And very similar to the uh, effects of phosgene, if that part of your lung is damaged, then serum will flood from your bloodstream into your lungs and you'll die from a sort of internal drowning. With water flooding the pipes, time was running out. The tank should have been protected from contamination, but a catalogue of failures was about to have the most terrible consequences for the people of Bhopal. The tragedy at Bhopal happened when some 35 tons of a lethal chemical called methyl isocyanate reacted with water and vaporized. Thousands of people in the shanty town that surrounds the plant were gassed, dying in the same horrific way that soldiers were killed in the First World War. The disaster was due to an amazing combination of circumstances. Had each happened on their own, the accident would never have occurred. In terms of designing chemical plants, there are really two sorts of safety. One is designing the plant to be safe in the first place, and the second is operating it safely. And at Bhopal, there were problems in both areas. Three hours to go until the catastrophic release. The first of many hundreds of litres of water found their way from a routine cleaning operation into the main pipe system that ran throughout the factory. It should have been impossible for the water to get very far, but mistake number one had already been made. A safety procedure existed to isolate sections of pipeline before they were cleaned. A simple piece of metal called a slip blind is inserted and the bolts done up tight achieving an impenetrable seal. Incredibly, this procedure was often ignored at Bhopal. To install a slip blind like this would probably take about two hours and you would have had to wear a lot of protective clothing because when you undid the bolts of these flanges, the possibility of chemicals splashing onto you would be there. If one of these small pieces of steel had been inserted into the process pipeline, in all probability, this disaster would not have happened. By 9.30, the water was able to travel freely through the hundreds of meters of pipe 
that separated the main plant from the MIC storage area and its deadly content. The disaster could still have been averted, however, had the gauges in the factory's control room been trustworthy. When this plant was designed and installed, the instrumentation here was probably state-of-the-art as far as India goes. Over the years, lack of maintenance contributed to the instruments giving faulty readings from time to time, which probably led to the operators and to the staff not taking the readings very seriously. MIC is kept under pressure with inert gas to stop anything from getting into the tank. But for six weeks, the pressure gauge had read virtually zero. It was presumed that the gauge was faulty. In fact, there was a leaky valve connecting the tank to the plant's main pipe system. If gas could get out, then water could get in. By approximately 10 o'clock, the contamination had started. The reaction of MIC in water generates carbon dioxide as one of its products. It also generates heat. Of course, the heat starts to warm the mixture. It's an exothermic reaction, as we call it. What I'm going to do is a similar reaction that obviously uses much safer chemicals. This material is going to behave rather like the MIC did. The material I'm adding is in effect the water that, was, uh, that came into the vessel. We add that and as you can see gas bubbles start to form. Water is denser than MIC, so it falls to the bottom of the vessel. The first part of the reaction takes place where the two layers of liquid meet. So this looks exactly like the MIC water interface would. We're generating bubbles at the boundary between the two liquid layers. But the key issue is the heat. This heat heats up the reaction mixture. The temperature rises. And when the temperature rises, the reaction speeds up and in turn generates heat even faster. It's what we call a runaway. Even with water in the tank, it should have been possible to control the situation. MIC has to be kept cool, and the tanks were housed in a concrete bunker, insulating them from the fierce heat of central India. There was also a cooling system controlled from a purpose-built refrigeration plant. The senior management, however, had decided to switch it off. This wasn't running on the night of the tragedy. In fact, it had been off since May 84. The coolant inside had been removed and it was permanently disabled. Switching the refrigeration off was an insane thing to do. These reactions, these exothermic runaway reactions, uh, take place when we're generating more heat than we can remove. The refrigeration system was there to remove heat. Switching it off made this incident much, much more likely. Incredibly, another safety device had been bypassed, in defiance of Union Carbide's own operating instructions. You see now the reaction is getting quite enthusiastic, getting some bubbles, some droplets of liquid coming out of the top of the vessel. And if this were an industrial scale vessel, we would have a significant emergency on our hands. At Bhopal, there was a machine purpose-built to deal with toxic gases, a device known as a vent gas scrubber. 